Be gone, you hag who lurks in dreams, who drains our life through cries and screams. God bless this ward to keep me whole and keep the night hag from my soul. The term hag is pretty straightforward. In any fantasy game you play, it is typically used to refer to a form of witch, someone who dwells in the swamp concocting vile poisons and dark magics in order to pervert nature or civilization. In Dungeons and Dragons, the same applies, except that they're not actually mortal. They're not women, really. The Monster Manual tells us that they used to be spirits or creatures of the Feywild, but because of their dark costumes and macabre rituals, they were banished and instead found a new home in the lower plains where they became fiends. Essentially, hags come from the hell of Dungeons and Dragons. This is why even though they look human-ish, they're actually not. They possess superhuman strength and incredible agility even though they look the way they do. Much of what you will find in the Monster Manual is flavored text that will come to as no surprise to you. Most of this you will already know. For example, it says here that hags possess magical powers, that they can alter their form or curse their foes. It says here that their withered faces are framed by long frayed hair, horrid moles and warts dot their blotchy skin, and their long skinny fingers are tipped by claws that can slice open flesh with a touch. To be fair, I, I always appreciate when they actually describe the monster that we're we're talking about because they never do that actually. Most times we have to rely on the pictures that they give us to know how the monster actually looks. Now there are different types of hags and each of them have their own behavior and personality so a lot of this will not apply to all of them. That's why we're just gonna go ahead and grab the important relevant stuff from here and take it. Since this is a fairly long page we're gonna skip some of the fluff. Now this part here is the big one. It says that hags propagate by snatching and devouring human infants. After stealing a baby from its cradle or its mother's womb, the hag consumes the poor child. A week later, the hag gives birth to a daughter who looks human until her 13th birthday, whereupon the child transforms into the spitting image of her hag mother. There's actually more to this ritual right here. It's not fully automatic as the monster manual makes it seem, but we'll cover that in a bit. Hags sometimes raise the daughters that they spawn, creating covens. A hag might also return the child to its grieving parents, only to watch from the shadows as the child grows up to become a horror. Now these entire two paragraphs describe the general behavior of hags, but a lot of it is self-evident, things that you probably would already assume. They treat all other creatures as inferior and only treat with mortals that show deference to them. They enjoy watching mortals bring about their own downfall. They love the macabre and festoon their garb with dead things. Attractive creatures evoke disgust in a hag. They sharpen their teeth on millstones and spin cloth from the intestines of their victims, reacting with glee to the horror that their actions evoke. Now down here it gets more interesting. Hags maintain contact with each other and share knowledge. Through such contact, it is likely that any given hag knows every other hag in existence. They don't like each other, but they abide by an ageless code of conduct. They break no oaths given to other hags as long as the oath isn't given with their fingers crossed. Down here, by the end of the hag's entry, we get their lairs, though it is also pretty straightforward. They dwell in dark and twisted woods, bleak moors, storm-lashed seacoasts, and gloomy swamps. In time, the landscape around the hag's lair reflects the creature's noxiousness. We might touch on covens in a future video, but for now, I, I just want to focus on night hags. Now, for these gals, we actually get some extra info. They have their own page, and that info is pretty interesting. It says here that the night hags were once creatures of the Feywild, we knew that, but their foulness saw them exiled to Hades long ago, where they degenerated into fiends. The night hags have long since spread across the lower plains. That's interesting. While a humanoid sleeps, a night hag can straddle the person ethereally and intrude upon its dreams. Any creature with true sight can see the hag's spectral form straddling its prey. The ethereal hag fills her victim's head with doubts and fears in the hope of tricking it into performing evil acts in the waking world. 
the hag continues her nightly visitations until the victim finally expires in its sleep. If the hag has driven her victim to commit evil deeds, she traps his corrupted soul in her soul bag for transport to Hades. We also get a sidebar here about the items that a night hag carries. It says, a night hag carries two very rare magic items that she must craft for herself. If either object is lost, the night hag will go to great lengths to retrieve it, as creating a new tool takes time time and effort. First one here we got the Heartstone. This lustrous black gem allows a night hag to become ethereal while it is in her possession. The touch of a Heartstone also cures any disease. Crafting a Heartstone takes 30 days. Then we get the soul bag. When an evil humanoid dies as a result of the night hag's nightmare haunting, the hag catches the soul in this black sack made of stitched flesh. A soul bag can hold only one evil soul at a time, and only the night hag who crafted the bag can catch a soul with it. Crafting a soul bag takes seven days and the humanoid sacrifice whose flesh is used to make the bag. Whoo, there you have it. This far into the video and we just barely covered the monster manual entry for the night hag. You know, I gotta say, we got a lot of info, to be honest. We got a full page of behavior and a couple of paragraphs specifically about the night hag, and we even got magic items, yet still, somehow, they've managed to neglect putting in the single most important aspect of the night hag. Night hags are soul mongers, just how the monster manual calls them, but what do they do with those souls? What are these hags doing in Hades of all places? Well, buckle up, because this one is a doozy. Let's talk about what the Monster Manual does not tell you about night hags. Jesus Christ, where do I even begin? Night hags are interdimensional traders, their currency being souls. They go around and gather souls just so that they can trade them to those who would need them, which turns out, many, there are many who would. This video is about to take a twist that you probably were not expecting. For me to be able to explain this, I actually have to go a little bit into the economics of the lower planes. And the big currency here are larvae. See, when a person dies, uh, sometimes they go to heaven. However, if they're evil, they go to hell, as you would imagine. Now, when you go to hell as a, as a person in the Forgotten Realms, you don't really go to hell with your human body. It's, it's not like you have your human body and the devils torture you or anything like that. Instead, what happens is, your soul gets transported into the lower planes and you appear in the lower planes as a larva. A larva is essentially just like a conduit of your soul, it's just your soul in the shape of a larva. The devils and the demons are at war, and they have been since basically before anyone can even remember. This is called the Blood War. For those of you new to Dungeons and Dragons, devils and demons are very different. Devils are lawful, strict, disciplined, and live in the Nine Hells, whereas demons are chaotic and monstrous and live in the Abyss. They say that if one side were to ever win against the other, the world would end because the winner would just conquer the multiverse. They also say that millions die on each side of the war every single day. Neither devils nor demons truly reproduce. Instead, they grab souls, turn them into their kind, and then evolve them using magic. For example, a devil might turn a human soul into an imp, and provided that the imp shows competence, it might be rewarded by a higher up by being promoted into a spined devil, then promoted again into a bearded devil, then maybe into a barbed devil, and so on and so forth, until eventually it might reach the end of the chain and become a pit fiend. This is how devils reproduce, and demons are actually not so different from that. With so many of their kind dying in the blood war, both devils and demons need a constant supply of new souls to fuel the war effort, and this is where the night hags come in. See, when an evil person dies, their soul might manifest in the lower planes depending on their alignment. If you were lawful but evil, you will go to the nine hells. If you were chaotic and evil, you will go to the abyss. But if you were simply just evil, then you will go to Hades. Now, this is where it gets interesting. A humanoid soul that spawns in the lower planes spawns as a larva. They look like worms, except that they possess a face that sort of looks like the face the individual had in life. The interesting bit is that the best souls are actually the ones that spawn in Hades, and here's why. The planes, the dimensions, exude their energies across it. 
the nine hails, for example, being lawful evil, exude lawful evilness across it. Which means if you were to live there, you would actually see yourself turn more and more lawful evil. The plane itself just sort of changes you. This, of course, has interesting consequences all across the board, but especially to the larvae that spawn in the region. Larvae from the Nine Hails are notoriously difficult to promote into devils. That is because a lawful person is not very malleable. They have their way of being and they are very difficult to persuade differently. In the Outer Plains, physicality and mental states are actually very much conjoined. A soul that is very lawful evil will not be very easily changeable or very easily malleable. That's just the nature of being lawful evil and that's just the nature of being in the nine hells. So when you have a very lawful larva, you have a larva that is very difficult to evolve because it wants to keep its shape. The opposite applies in the abyss. The larva that spawn there are too chaotic and they seldom keep any shape that is given to them. When a demon tries to evolve a larva into a demonic fighter, more often than not, they actually turn into something else instead. This is why both devils and demons seek the larva that spawn in Hades, the very middle ground between these two. and. Well, who owns Hades? The Night Hags own Hades. The Night Hags have actually created an enormous emporium in Hades where they profit from the Blood War by gathering all the larva that spawns in the plain and selling it to the highest bidder. Quote, Ask more planner folk what they think about the Night Hags and you will hear pretty much the same answer. A crafty bunch of evil old crones. Who else are better suited to snatch up larvae and sell the stinking worms for a tidy bit of jink? Talk to the Celestials and they'll tell you that they hate the hags because hags are the villains who perpetuate the foul races of the lower plains by bartering larvae to the fiends. Fiends think a little more kindly of hags because there is no one better at delivering quality larvae. The night hags don't care much of what anyone thinks of them, as long as they continue to acquire knowledge, wealth and ultimately greater personal power with the selling of larvae larva, nothing else really matters. The mistresses of the Great Waste sit secure in the comfort that ruling the larva trade means ruling the plane." End quote. Quote, Scholars who study the lower plains have wondered why no one has ever sought to control the Great Waste as others have on Batesu or some layers of the Abyss. To date, not one infernal fiend lord has risen to claim the Great Waste for its own. Some say it's a despairing, will-sapping effect of the Waste that stops anyone from even wanting to try to conquer it. But that's just not true. Fact is, the Night Hags rule the Great Waste, but they don't rule by any obvious show of force. Hags are more careful controlling the gloomy plane via their skillful manipulation of the larva trade. You see, by playing the various factions in the Blood War off each other, the hags have secured their position as the planner rulers of the Grey Waste." End quote. It is said that the Emporium in Hades is the grandest bazaar and marketplace in all of the lower planes, with both devils and demons rubbing shoulders in order to buy larva. The river Styx passes through the market, making it easier to get to, and the market is said to be overseen by what is believed to be the longest surviving hag coven ever. Outside of Larva, you can also purchase all manner of interdimensional contraband in the Emporium, from Blood War weapons and armor to dark magics and slaves. They say that there is a restaurant in there as big as a whole town. The way hags go about collecting the larva is actually pretty mundane as it looks very similar to a shepherd. The larva just sort of materializes all of the sudden in the lower planes, but they tend to materialize close to an already existing larva. So if you have a clumped up group of larva, chances are that more will spawn there together if you give it some time, which is why you would find tons of larva pens in the plane. Now knowing this, you might be wondering, wait, hold up. If it's so easy to get larva in Hades, then why would a night hag go through all of the trouble trying to seduce a person in the material plane to do evil just so that they can snatch his soul? Well, not all larva are actually the same. Generally speaking, the more powerful the individual, the greater the larva is. But the method of its transformation is also pretty important. Evil souls that die and end up in Hades through the natural way are not quite as grand. On the other hand, a powerful soul that gets directly turned into a larva by a hag is the most powerful, and hence can get sold for a lot of money. 
Now, generally speaking, it is still not worth it. And that's why 99% of the night hacks that deal in the larva trade actually stay in Hades. But still, some night hacks appreciate the journey more so than the destination and they try and obtain the grandest and the most exquisite of larva through direct means, which is why they live in the material realm. See, a normal larva is typically transformed by devils and demons into the lowest form of their kind, a lemur by the devils or a mane by the demons. But a larva obtained by corrupting a powerful evil entity in the material realm can actually completely skip that part and be transformed into a full devil or demon, making them a lot more valuable and worth a hell of a lot of money. Essentially, the night hacks that you encounter in your adventures in the material realm are the true badasses that are going out of their way for the high risk, high reward. Since a larva is essentially just a soul in the shape of a worm, it can be used for anything that a soul can typically be used for. It can feed the monsters that feed on souls, it can be used for rituals that require souls, and it can feed the phylactery of a lich. In fact, you will always see many a lich bartering in Hades trying to get himself a nice supply of larva to keep himself undead. In fact, it's funny that it is explicitly told in the lore that hacks don't quite respect liches as much as they respect the devils and demons, and because of that, liches get swindled all the time in Hades. Quote, Poor quality larvae are generally either destroyed or usually sold to clueless liches. End quote. Now, there's also a third way of obtaining larva, or for an entity to become larva, which happens when an astral traveler spends too long in Hades, which happens. Hey, many people go out to explore the multiverse, and sometimes they stay too long in a place where they shouldn't have stayed too long, and well, if you stay too long in Hades, bad things happen. See, Hades is cool because it is kind of like the bottom of the multiverse. If you were to go to heaven, for example, and you would find Mount Olympus, if you were to actually climb down the mountain, you would find yourself in Hades. Why? Because the base of the mountain, the base of Mount Olympus, actually starts in Hades. The same thing actually applies to Yggdrasil, the world tree. The roots of Yggdrasil are actually found in Hades, and the tree grows all the way from Hades all the way to Isgard. So there are actually many reasons why an astral explorer might find themselves down here, without even mentioning the fact that visiting the Night Hag Grand Emporium would actually be very beneficial to any explorer. Now the thing is, the energies of Hades sap all will and all color from you. If you were to arrive in Hades with a blue shirt, for example, in the span of a day, you would actually notice that your shirt would have permanently turned gray. This is why the lands of Hades are actually called the Grey Waste, because they absorb all color. Now, this actually also happens to your emotions, and this is the very dangerous part. The plane sucks on your feelings and emotions until there's nothing left. Once you have no color and no emotions, you start to disappear, turning translucent at first, but eventually simply disappearing and turning into a larva. Anyways, there you have it, this huge part of being a night hag that was completely neglected in the monster manual. These gals are actually a major power in the politics and the grand scheme of things in the Forgotten Realms. You would never have imagined that night hags were a major player alongside devils, demons and angels in the multiverse, but hey, there you have it. Now, let's actually go small picture for the rest of the video and focus on more specific things about the hag that the monster manual would not tell you. The Hearthstone is not really called a Hearthstone, that's just the name given to it by humanoids who find it from the corpses of the hags that they slay, namely so because of its shape. Hags wouldn't really use such a cute name for it, instead, they actually call it the Charm of Blackness. And the reason a hag goes through a lot of trouble to get it back if it's ever stolen just how the monster manual suggested, is because it actually cost them a grand fortune to create. The monster manual doesn't tell you, of course, they just tell you that it takes 30 days to create. But the thing is, the real problem is that it cost them 100 souls to create, and they can only create it back in Hades, which is a major pain in the ass for them. Also, they don't tell you that the Hearthstone is meant to be used only by evil people. 
When a good person uses it to cure diseases, the stone actually starts breaking. The stone can only typically cure about 10 diseases before completely breaking, if used by a good person. I should also take the time to mention here that, now that we're talking about diseases, that the bite of a hag can produce a very foul disease. The disease is called demon fever, and it has an incubation of about a day. After that, if it's not cured, you will lose your constitution permanently every day it progresses. Also, hags have a special ability to turn evil dead humanoids into larvae. They don't really need to go through the whole process of mounting the ethereal form of a sleeping person like the monster manual suggests. In fact, it is very explicitly told to us that a night hag's favorite way of obtaining the soul of an evil person is to simply use an extremely powerful version of the sleep spell on their target and then simply strangle the individual in their sleep. Essentially, all they need to steal the soul of an evil person is to just kill that evil person. And then once they have the soul, they can turn that soul into a larva so that they can sell that larva in Hades. It is only when the individual that they're hunting cannot be put to sleep that they actually resort to dream attacks, like in the case of a powerful adventurer who keeps resisting her spells. Now, this is where the previous lore of night hacks actually directly conflicts with the lore given to us by the Monster Manual. We were told that hacks could only attack the dreams of evil people, and that as long as you were good, hacks could actually not touch you in your sleep. This, of course, is not what the Monster Manual tells us, saying that they, in fact, specifically target good people in their sleep in order to corrupt them. But hey, Take whatever you wish from that, but in the old lore, it was said that when a night hag terrorized a village, it was always the criminals that died first, until the town ran out of them and she would have to resort to corrupting those who were left in order to kill them. I want to specify that for a soul to turn into a larva, the soul has to be evil. That's why they need, that's why they have to corrupt you. Now, in the Monster Manual, we're told that hacks propagate by snatching and devouring human infants, and that a week later after doing so, they give birth to a daughter who looks human until her 13th birthday, whereupon the child transforms into the spitting image of her hag mother. What the Monster Manual doesn't tell you is that there is an actual process and ritual that the hag needs to make sure the child goes through for the transformation to actually happen. Quote, at any time between the child's first birthday and puberty, a night hag might return to perform a series of despoiling rites that culminate in the child's transformation into a normal night hag. The process begins with an initial visitation during which the night hag must engage her child in a foul ceremony for an interrupted hour. After this initial ritual, the night hag must return three times, each visit 13 days after the last. On these visits, the night hag must suckle the child and feed it the flesh of a living larva, a process that takes an hour. If any of these feedings are interrupted, or if the night hag cannot access the child by the end of the proper day, the child cannot be transformed into a night hag. Otherwise, the end of the final feeding initiates a rapid and irreversible transformation, and within an hour, the child becomes a full-grown night hag. Uncaring of their daughters but covetous of their uses, night hags often foster more children than they have any intention of transforming into full-blooded night hags, essentially keeping spare children littered across the plains should their plants require more servants or their current broods dwindle." End quote. If this ritual cannot be finished, the child simply will grow into a normal child. I should also mention that night hacks can indeed have normal children the normal way, something that the Monster Manual doesn't mention. A night hack can polymorph herself into a normal human and seduce men into impregnating her. The resulting daughter will look normal in every regard, of course, once again until it reaches purity. If the despoiling ritual is never done, then the child will simply grow up normally. These children, by the way, are candidates into becoming sorcerers with a hag ancestry. I should also mention that even though there is absolutely no way of telling a hag child apart from a normal child, do know that hag children will always, 100% of the time, have black hair. That's the single only defining feature that they all share.
I should also mention that creating children is actually pretty important for a night hag, more so than with other types of hags, because night hags specifically actually dislike forming covens with any other type of hag. They see green and sea hags as being lesser, and with good reason. They are also not a big fan of making covens with each other, actually, so they actually rely on creating daughters and subjugating them by making covens with them but through domination. In these covens, not all hags are equal, but instead, the mother night hag is the ringleader and the rest follow her demands. When encountering a night hag, be mindful of the fact that they actually prefer having not just one, but two different layers. There's always the layer that they keep in the material realm, where they grow their poisons, where they putrefy their meat and raise their plants, but there's always a secret hidden layer in the ethereal realm. Hacks can face things from the material realm and move them into the ethereal by simply grabbing them as they shift. And by doing this, they move stone and other objects and form a lair on the other side of the veil. These fortifications are typically used for holding important prisoners, people that they wouldn't want to risk existing in the material realm. This prevents most people from finding their holdings and allows a hag to always have a secondary place to run to. See, when an adventuring group is hag hunting, what the hag likes to do is to find one of her prisoners in the ethereal realm, kill them, and then face the corpses back to reality in front of the adventurers as a warning sign, and generally there's nothing that the adventurers can do if they don't have the ability to face into the ethereal, which is likely. A favorite technique of the night hag as well is to grapple an adventurer and then face him into the ethereal realm, effectively taking the adventurer with her. If the adventurer doesn't have a way to get back, then they are stuck on the other side. Now let's go back to big talk for the end of this video. The hags actually have a cosmic secret. In fact, they probably have many, but there's one in particular that I want to talk about. For this, we will go back to the monster manual. This is in the Yugoloth section, quote, the first Jugaloth were created by a sisterhood of night hags on Jahina. It is widely believed that Asmodeus, the Lord of the Nine Hells, commissioned the work in the hope of creating an army of fiends that were not bound to the Nine Hells." End quote. So the night hags were the original creators of the Jugaloth, a large group of fiends that reside on the neutral grounds of the lower plains. But what's interesting about this is the connection that hags have with the Jugaloths. See, hags actually possess a secret ritual that can actually transform any Jugaloth into an Ultraloth, a fiend so powerful it actually possesses the strength to combat and even defeat monsters such as Baylors or Pit Fiends. If you were ever wondering how you could ever use Night Hacks for a level 20 campaign, well, here it is. This power alone has saved the hacks in Hades from countless wars, and it is a secret that they keep from any other power in the multiverse, and of course, not something mentioned in the Monster Manual. First, a contract has to be made between the Hags and the Jugaloth, where the Hags will grant the Jugaloth unbelievable power in exchange for a service. When both parties have accepted the terms, the process can begin. First, they obtain an enormous cauldron that will be filled with the waters from the river Styx and putrid larva. A huge fire is lit under the cauldron and the Jugaloth is sealed within the cauldron with melted wax made from the slimy larval residue. Wards will be placed around the cauldron and the incantations by the hags will begin that will imbue their champion with magical power. The hags will sacrifice their own life force in order to give it to the Jugaloth in order to make it more powerful. However, a hag cannot die in the process, but can be left on the verge of death. The more hags given their life force, the stronger the Jugaloth will be, with seemingly no real limits to how strong they can make it. In fact, some of the stronger Ultraloths in the multiverse took months of the hags giving them power. When the power giving is finished, the drained hags will be exhausted and in no way to survive any form of encounter. They will not be able to defend themselves against anyone or anything for weeks. When the ritual is taking place, it's also kept a secret in order to prevent people from killing the hags while they are weakened. Now, the cauldron must be kept at boiling temperatures for the entire time of the ritual. Typically, you will actually see hags in prison fire methods under the cauldron to make sure that the cauldron always stays at boiling temperatures, because if it's ever not, then the Jugaloth dies and the ritual is ruined. 
the cauldron will remain there at boiling temperatures for an average of about two years of seeping. But when it is done, it will finish with the violent explosion of the cauldron spraying out larval juice and chunks of heated metal everywhere. Emerging from the cauldron would be the newest hag champion, an Ultraloth. Magical precautions would have been woven into the transforming incantations by the night hacks that virtually guarantee the loyalty of their new creation. If the Ultraloth attacks one of its mistresses or ignores the condition of the contract, it will immediately suffer racking pain, which will continue until the creature either dies or stops. Only the completion of the contract can free the Ultraloth from its restriction. Should one of the Ultraloths hag creators die during the time of the contracted period of servitude, the Ultraloth also dies. It is therefore in the Ultraloth's best interest to see the well-being of his mistresses until the contract has expired. Now guys, the power of this monster cannot be understated and it is definitely a campaign-wide power. An example of an Ultraloth is Serlik, the boatman of the River Styx, the one who ferries souls down the river, believed to be one of the strongest powers in the multiverse. Happy Halloween, everybody, and thank you so much for watching this extraordinarily long video. I, I do apologize a little bit for it being so long, but I, I personally felt like if we wanted to explore the Night Hacks, that there was no way that I, that I couldn't just not explore the place where they actually come from, the place where 99% of the Hacks actually come from. There's this entire massive society of them living out there in this extraplanar reality and the monster manual of course you know no mention of it so i felt hey i'm gonna do a service here and bring that up um even though it ended up in this video being extraordinarily long in any case i would like to personally thank my patron supporters rucato fan daniel luna dr cowbell skits your boy major fail gaming barry mascant 5e magic shop daniel umar morgan johnson zach bowell simon holman rusty rain biotechnofrag and meaty ogre at best for supporting me on patreon at the 25 dollar level if you would like to support me as well then please head on over to patreon.com slash mr rex to support once again, guys, thank you so much for watching and have a beautiful day. Oh, and before I forget, of course, please go and watch the playlist. All of those videos are as good as this one, I promise you. Go watch the playlist. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.